Hey everyone, welcome to today's newest episode of Heal Thyself. Man, I'm so excited to bring you this fire today. Today, today. So thank you for rating, reviewing, subscribing, supporting the show. Please do not forget to support us. We are doing some big things here and we're doing it all for you. Now, today's knowledge bomb is going to be one of my favorite ones, one I've been waiting to talk about. I can't wait to go over the product review because it's going to be very helpful for you now or in the future. And boy, oh boy, this special guest, a close friend of mine and a bearer of the most incredible information for us to make moves. So without further ado, let us get into the show. All right, all right, all right. Today's knowledge bomb. We need to talk. We need to talk. We need to talk. This stuff is so important, and it's one of my favorite things to do in this show and in medicine in general is come with this information that no one is really giving us or talking to us about. It's really important to start dropping these knowledge bombs where it can be really helpful long term, but it's something that no one's talking about. Now, when it comes to home air quality, It's a major long-term determinant of our health, right? Because we live at home. We spend so much time at home, all weekend sometimes in the winter. So we have to think about how much time we spend there and how it's going to be affecting our health and how do we optimize that. So according to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, the most effective way to reduce indoor air pollution is to reduce or eliminate all these harmful sources of these chemical emissions. And what they mean by that is that there are certain materials in the home that have chemical emissions. They emit compounds which are uh, very much so putting our health in a vulnerable position. So when you think of full-on home emissions, well, you start thinking about things like furniture, furnishings, cleaning products. All these things have off-gassing properties. But today's show is going to be on everything, all things, everything, beds, 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 beds. And why do I talk about beds? Actually, beds are one of the first things I talk about when it comes to home environment because we're in bed. We're in bed eight hours a day with a good sleep, maybe sometimes seven, maybe sometimes six. But regardless, the bed is a dynamic environment because our temperature, our body heat, hot, cold, movement, sweat, that's all liberating these chemical compounds. So it's dynamic based on us. And not all beds are the same. And certainly not all people are the same with conditions, right? There's different levels of sensitivity. So what I'm saying is you may get a Tempur-Pedic bed and be affected by it, but you know your brother may not. It, it, again, it's biochemical individuality, but I'm here to tell you that not all beds are created equal, and we need to be aware of this topic. The education behind this is so, so important. I'm telling you this now, certainly not as an alarmist, but someone who's empowering you to start making moves and make, have a better understanding. So what matters with these indoor variables are this. What's the type of pollutant, right? Pollutants can be very toxic. Some of them we know are carcinogenic to the T, but how much of that is coming out? What's its concentration? And certainly I mentioned long-term, what is the duration of the exposure? As well as what is the method of exposure? Inhalation, ingestion, going through the skin, dermal. So all of these things are important when you couple that with the individual sensitivity, well then we can make a perfect soup for disease down the road, right? So when you think about conditions of the home, you wanna think about what's the ventilation level? Okay, I have a really crappy bed and I can't afford one for another year or two. So how, how much ventilation is flowing through the home? How much light is hitting it? What is the age of the home? What is the age of the building, right? What about the indoor temperature, the humidity levels? These are all things that impact how pathogenic these chemicals can be to your health. So beds, as I mentioned, more than anything, we have a very intimate relationship with our bed. It's a dynamic environment. So it's important for us to be sure that we're creating the best possible conditions. So long-term, when we're sleeping on this bed, we're putting ourselves at the best uh, level of health, okay? So as per the environmental working group, mattresses release a small amount of gaseous chemicals over time, right? What increases it? Particularly body heat. Is it safe for all of us as an, as healthy adults? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's a minute amount, maybe it's not. But certainly, certainly, when you think about children and infants, that's where we're really getting into a yellow red zone, okay? Because chemicals, and remember, don't ever let someone tell you, oh, well, you know, the bed releases Halloween. Halloween has been shown to be kind of toxic, but at this level, it's not. We have to think about everything else. We're not in a vacuum. So the way the bed affects us 
right? It's certainly not is certainly not in a vacuum. So we have to think about how does the bed affect us? How does the couch affect us? How does the cleaning surprise affect us? How does the cosmetic uh, that we're using, the personal care products? Remember, it's a big glass that is being filled and filled and filled. So as I mentioned, children and infants are particularly susceptible to these effects. Now, it's not all in a vacuum, as I mentioned, and you have to think about allostatic load. So when you look for a mattress, when you look for a mattress, you want to make sure there's a few things. It's no less than 95% certified organic content. Now, the problem with these mattresses, particularly these standard mattresses and these tempur mattresses, is that they use petrochemically derived chemicals, polyurethane. Right, polyurethane is the main thing that that, is, that creates the foam. That's the same main material creating the foam in the bed that makes it nice and comfy. Yes, but that, again, that's derived from petrochemicals. These are synthetic and crude, coming from crude oil. These contain something called isocyanates. Isocyanates are the main cause of these volatile organic compounds. And I'm going to talk about what they are. But these are connected to asthma, respiratory issues, uh, inflammation of the mucosa, like the eyes and the skin. Right, so. Again, as I mentioned, it's not the same for everyone, but if you have a kid who's coming every time onto your bed or on their own bed and suffering from these things, don't look outside of your home first, right? An allergist will say, hey, they're allergic to birch trees. Well, the, the allergist or the environmental doctor or someone needs to pay close attention to what the, what the child is being exposed to, okay? So there's also uh, added flame retardants, rightfully so. Because if there's a fire that starts, you certainly don't want to be sleeping in bed and for it to combust. But what you want to know is that these flame retardants are pretty toxic too, right? They affect our health. They're in furnitures, airplanes, baby clothes, mattresses. And when it comes to these flame retardants, you can find other healthier natural sources of flame retardants like wool. Wool is something that they put into these natural beds that have the same effect. Wool has a really high combustion point, right? So it takes a lot for wool to be set on fire. So it's really protecting on these new beds. Now, the problem with flame retardants is they're bioaccumulant. They bioaccumulate in our body. So not only are you having hundreds of different types of endocrine disruptors, hormone disruptors, thyroid disruptors, immune system disruptors, nervous system disruptors, right? They're both toxic to that. Reproductive system disruptors and birth defects. They're causing birth defects. They're carcinogenic. These are all things that we know that these flame retardants are doing, and we know that they bioaccumulate over time. So it doesn't matter if it's a little bit. Remember, it's a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. That starts filling up, right? One drop in the bucket, that bucket's going to overflow at some point. Again, children are most vulnerable. So what do you want? You want low VOC certification. I'm going to tell you all about the certifications, but that's definitely something you want to watch. When it comes to the volatile organic compounds, we have things like xylene, acetates, ethyl benzene, benzene, acetate aldehyde, formaldehyde, these are all associated with a big spectrum of disruptions to our health. As I, and I mentioned a few, just like the flame retardants, right? Our immune system, our nervous system, our hormones, they're carcinogenic, particularly formaldehyde, benzene. We know this. So a lot of the time, the risk is not acute, but it's lifetime exposure, right? And then we have diseases like cancer coming in, you know, in the 60, when we're 60, and we wonder what happened, but it's lifetime. We also want to make sure we avoid things with added fragrances. A lot of the time they do these for kids' beds, added fragrances or even antimicrobials. The antimicrobials are putting on them when they say mold resistant, right? That's, it's usually a chemical that's being sprayed. You want to stay away from PVC. You want to stay away from vinyl, right? PVC or vinyl, the things that we use on our shower curtains, but we know that they disrupt our hormones. Uh, they disrupt our immune system. They're really nasty. And a lot of these beds have these as a big primary material. So what are some solutions, right? I, look, I'm, I'm here to give you the problem. So you know that there is a problem because how many of you out there even knew that beds can be toxic? Certainly, like I said, I'm not trying to be an alarmist. I'm giving you the education so you know, but I'm coming with the solutions. You know I'm coming with the solutions. You got to come with solutions. You got to make moves. We got to empower each other, okay? So some solutions. We got to tackle the off-gassing. The off-gassing is the major issue. Now, off-gassing is an option in the beginning. We can keep it outside, let it off-gas, especially when we take it off of the plastic. You know that smell? That's all chemicals, volatile organic compounds. You want to make sure you have good ventilation in your home or let that bed out, let it off gas for a while outside, okay? Sarah Evans, she's an assistant professor, a professor of environmental, sorry, I'm going to do that again. 
Sarah Evans, she's an assistant professor of environmental medicine and public health at the Eichen School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. So she goes, often we think, well, if you let something air out for a little bit, you can dramatically reduce the level of chemicals that are off gas. But in reference to this study, and she was uh, actually uh, referencing an Israeli study, she says in reference to the study, the Matra study out of Israel, in, in this case, even after six months, Six months, they still saw appreciable levels of off-gassing. Six months, right? So in this study, they concluded that volatile organic compounds were under significant levels for risk, but accounting for a child's age when they adjusted for that, they showed that their safe levels were actually approaching exceeding limits, right? So what, what, what you know, to conclude that, that says basically like, we as adult, healthy humans in bed, there's low amounts of emissions that day to day won't affect us. But I remember, remember I just said bioaccumulation, but day to day it can affect children. It's actually approaching exceeding the uh, exceedingly safe limits. So children are really, really at risk relative to their body size. Think about it. They're small. They breathe in more air relative to their body size than us. Their organs are already actively developing. They're close to the ground. So what, what, what that means is they're breathing in these heavier chemicals, these heavier airborne chemicals. They're closer to the ground. They're rolling around on the ground. They mouth breathe. So we don't have those mechanisms that are helping uh, filter out those chemicals. So when we talk about airflow, remember I mentioned airflow being a big part of the house. You've got to make sure there's airflow. One of the things that make me cringe is during the winter when everything's closed up and they just have the heat on and people don't open the windows for months on end. It's, it's, a, big, it's a big move and it's a risky move. So you got to make sure you have that airflow going. Even if it's cold outside, make sure you have some airflow. Keep, open up the windows. Dr. Kenneth Spath, he, he's the chief of occupational environmental medicine at Northwell Health in Great Neck, New York. Basically, he said indoor air can have as much as 10 times higher volatile organic compounds than outdoor air. Getting fresh air in in the house can really help reduce those exposures, right? This is from a professional, not me, not little old me, professional, right? This guy is in it every single day, day to day. What I'm trying to say is you can't overemphasize the importance of a simple move is opening your window and allowing that airflow. Materials, okay, now we're getting to the good stuff because now I'm gonna teach you how to buy what, what, what labels you wanna look at. To choose a better material, you wanna make sure you're reducing volatile organic compounds, period. You wanna reduce that so the materials that, that are in there are minimal to none. So one of the nastiest ones, remember I said were polyurethane. So you want polyurethane-free mattress. Mattresses that contain cotton, wool, natural latex, these are going to be no volatile organic compounds. And if they do have any, it's going to be very minimal, much, much better option for us. So you got to look for a mattress to be at least 95% organic content, right? Whether it be content, uh, cotton, wool, latex, you want 95% organic, as I said earlier. Look for the Global Organic Textile Standard Certification, GOTS, GOTS. You want that GOTS certification every time that you see when you, when you buy a bed, basically, especially if it has cotton, right? Because what that means is excluding the polyurethane. If it's a latex counterpart, you want to see the Global Organic Latex Standard. That's GOLS, G-O-L-S, right? So a lot of these beds are going to be purely cotton, purely latex, a hybrid between the two, and some of them are going to have wool. Right, so but usually cotton, latex, and wool are the big materials used in these natural beds. So certainly, if you're getting cotton, you want to make sure that they're not greenwashing the bed and saying, "Oh, it's natural cotton, but it's sprayed with glyphosate and other chemicals." Right, because cotton's a really dirty crop. You want to make sure it's GOT certified. Whereas a latex, you want to make sure that they're they're deriving it from a really clean source. So you're going to get that with the GOL certified G O L S. So again, they, some may be mixed, some may be individual. And now again, if it's latex, you wanna make sure it's 100% latex, right? Because here's a sneaky move that a lot of these mattress companies are doing. They're taking the latex and they're mixing it with polyurethane on the low. We don't even know, right? And they're saying it's a natural bed, natural latex, but they got that polyurethane sneaking in there. So like unlike polyurethane, there's no to low VOC emissions coming from latex. And on top of that, it's mold and dust mite resistant. Really cool. Say no to flame retardants. If you're not, if if it has these, if it has the GOLS or GOTS plus the other third party ones that I'm going to tell you about, then there's going to be no flame retardants. If you're unsure, call the company and be like, "Hey, tell me right now, are there flame retardants? Yes or no? No, prove it." There you go. Many companies will add wool as a flame retardant, as I mentioned earlier, and that's very that's a good move because it's really resistant and has a high flame point, right? So if you do end up being dead set on a foam mattress, Tempur-Pedics are the nastiest mattresses out there. Polyurethane, VOCs. I would encourage all folks who have a Tempur-Pedic to save up your money, and if you have the money to get a new bed, 
throw it out ASAP. Don't even burn it. Just throw it out. Get it out of your house. Get it out of your kid's vicinity. Get it out of your dog's vicinity. Get it out of your loved one's vicinity ASAP. tempur I, I will go on record and say tempur is the worst mattress you can have, okay? So get that polyurethane crap out of there. Cert, certified by independent third-party companies. Here are the other two labels that you really want to look for, right? Remember the GOTS, G-O-T-S, GOLS, G-O-L-S. The other one is the O-E-K-O Tex. Right, I'll just say Tech Standard 100. It's OEKO Tech Standard 100. Let's call it the Standard 100. It's the world's best known label for textiles, and it's tested for harmful substances. It's really strict standards. It's third party, and per their organization, they say means that uh, it, when having this label, it means that every component of this article, i.e., every thread, every button, every other accessory, has been tested for harmful substances, and that the article therefore is harmless in the human ecological terms. Really important from beginning to end to make sure that you have a really clean product, especially if you're sleeping on it, right? In many cases, the limit values for the standard 100 go beyond the national requirements and international requirements. So this is a third party that's really testing. Their counterpart is a Green Guard Gold. It's another really high standard. Not, there's very few beds that have a Green Guard Gold. I think about 1%, less than 1%. Green Guard Gold certified by the UL environment. This means they're scientifically tested for prolonged exposures in environmental chambers to meet rigorous emission standards. So this is really for VOCs and everything else. But so the way you can look at it is the, uh, the tech standard is really for a lot of the components uh, using clean components. They're also VOCs. Green Guard is a little bit VOC focused, more VOC focused, making sure there's no formaldehyde and phthalates. To be honest, some of the best beds out there have both of them. And then there's add-ons materials that they put on beds. So you want to make sure Avoid anything with fragrances or synthetic fragrances. Avoid anything that says antimicrobial components added, right? Foam mattresses, right? It, the glue that they use, you want to make sure that it's using a water-based glue versus a chemically-based glue, right? Oil-based glue, because that's emitting more VOCs. Make sure there's no PVC or vinyl and um, a plastic considered next to BPA. As I mentioned, the PVC, it's a really nasty one. as one of the worst for our health. Hormone disruptor, I mentioned it before. Okay. So the EPA in 2012, about PVC, they affirmed that PVC is not a healthy material and has negative impacts on human health. It's still in our system. It's still out there. In 2012, they imposed new restrictions on highly toxic emissions from PVC manufacturing facilities. They've made new rules on PVC because they know that PVC is a plastic that is, uh, that is making people sick. Okay, so I'll repeat that. You want to make sure they knew that they, this is a human carcinogen and there's very specific cancers associated with PVCs and vinyl chloride and dioxide being the two uh, part, of, part of life cycle, these, these chemicals that are really affecting us. So we don't know everything there is to know about chemicals, I promise you that. But in addition to cancer, we want to get that PVC out because of what it's doing to our health. So again, when it comes to our home health, there's not one silver or golden bullet, right? What we want to do is make sure we are maximizing our health by making sure the materials in there are safe. And where do we start? The none other, the bed, first and foremost, okay? Because we are on that, we are on it, we are on it, we are sleeping, our kids are sleeping in cribs and mattresses. So I'm here to tell you that beds are so, so important. Now, which beds? That's what we're gonna review on the product review. So let's get right into it. All right, so first and foremost on this product review, I'm gonna say this, avoid synthetic memory foams. I just said it in the knowledge bomb, I'll say it again, the polyurethane and the synthetic memory, tempur everything, they're off-gassing. You want, you want polyurethane free. Remember I said it's petrochemical derived, VOCs, nasty stuff. They even have plant-based foam mattresses. That's greenwashing, it's a tactic. What they're doing is they're using those petrochemically derived chemicals and polyurethane, and they're mixing it with plant oils and they're calling it a plant plant-based foam mattress. That's bold because it still has volatile organic compounds. If you absolutely need a foam mattress, you wanna make sure it has all the certifications that I was speaking about before, and I'll tell you about some ones over here. But really look for a pure latex one. That's gonna be the closest thing to foam. I had one a few years ago, it was a mattress topper. It worked well, it was beautiful and non-toxic, no smell when it came out of the box, exactly, that's what you need to look for. If you're having a baby, I cannot understate the importance of getting an organic mattress, really? If you can't afford a mattress for yourself and you're having a baby, put together the money and get and, and get the baby a mattress. It's gonna be so important for that baby's long-term health because remember I said that their systems are developing, they're really vulnerable to these chemicals. I mentioned polyurethane, these flame retardants, fragrances, PVC, phthalate, these are non-negotiables. If you're having a kid, remember, do everything you can to get 
and I and I there's different price points points on these beds that I'm talking about. So look into them, research, all right? But look for those standards. And multiple environmental experts are agreeing that the standards are not stringent enough for babies and children. And when adjusting for their weights, every all these chemicals, the amount that it's off-gassing approaches exceeding levels. We know they disrupt hormones. We know they affect our respiratory system. We know they affect our nervous system and they're carcinogenic. So remember, the four things that I told you to look for, GOTS, G-O-T-S, Gold Certification, right? Cotton latex wool, Green Guard Gold third-party testing, or the Tech Standard 100 uh, third-party testing. Those are the four things we really want to look for. You want to make sure that the, the materials are GOTS or Goals, and it has, it has got to be at least third-party tested, all right? All right, so let's talk about the good beds. Good, I'm not, uh, bad beds, uh, I usually start with all these bad, crappy beds. I tell you not to get a tempur If you have one, throw it away. Just know that most of these conventional beds are going to be built with these conventional materials, and they, they're going to fall under everything. So I can't name every conventional bed, but I promise you, I'm going to talk about the better beds. So good beds. These are devoid of polyurethane, pesticides, flame retardants, chemical adhesives, VOCs, right? These are all things that make us sick. First one is Zen Haven. Zen Haven is a pretty good one that I actually was looking into when I was getting a bed. It has a tech standard 100. That means it's third party tested. It uses latex and cotton, a mix of both, and it has wool as a flame retardant. Really nice one. Call the company if you're interested. Eco Cloud, latex and wool primarily. It has a tech standard 100 um, natural wood wool uh, fire barrier, and it uses wool as a flame retardant. Hapsi Beds, this is a hybrid of uh, wool, latex, and cotton. It's certified organic. The Bear Mattress and Tuft and Needle are two, uh, two other ones. They use memory foam. See, these are memory foam ones, right? And you know I don't like memory foam, but if you prefer memory foam, those are probably the two companies you want to go for because it uses a label called CertiPure label. CertiPure, I didn't mention before, but it means it's eco-friendly and, it, and it's low VOC memory foam. But to be honest, I really prefer latex overall. So instead of a memory foam, even CertiPure, I would actually go with the latex. My Green Mattress, a really nice one that I found, organic latex. It has uh, organic cotton certified plus, and it's tech, tech 100 certified. Those are the good ones. So here are some of my best ones, right? These are ones that have more sh more of the labels. You know, I, I just feel more comfortable with them. One of the most popular ones, and man, they did a marketing tidal wave last year was the avocado mattress. Avocado mattress is actually a really good one. It's gold certified, so the latex in there is organic. It's got certified, so the cotton there is organic. It's tech standard 100, third party tested, certified organic wool, and the mattress is Green Guard Gold third party tested. So it used basically all of those certifications cleared, and it's also made with safe, non toxic certified, uh, vegan certified, beautiful stuff. Like, I'm happy about that. So, Avocado right now is one of the top ones. I haven't found one that really is that, that much better. Plush Bed is a really good one too. It uses organic wool, cotton, and latex mix, and it has the Green Guard certification, which you know makes me very happy because Green Guard is stringent. So it's one of the very few companies to actually receive a Green Guard certification. Essentia Mattress is a mix of latex and natural memory foam, Goals and Got certified, and it has also the third party, both, the, both of them, the Tex 100 and the Green Guard certified. Brentwood Home, this is the bed that I have. Brentwood Home is really nice. It has a few in the line. And when you look at the line, uh, they vary in all the certifications. Each bed has different certifications, but really you'll see a mix of all the good ones. Gold certified, GOT certified, organic cotton coming from New Zealand. I mean, wool coming from New Zealand. Um, their line of beds vary in the certifications, but what you'll see is GOLs, GOTs, and the third-party testing. Birch bed, wool, and latex mix. It has a tech standard 100, Green Guard certified, independent, strict party, third party, as I mentioned. So... And Good Night Naturals, that's actually the last one. Good Night Naturals is something, I actually met the CEO. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that they have all of the labels, but I do know the CEO personally, so, and they make a really good one. They've actually been, they were actually the first natural bed on the market since 1993, I think this guy's been at it. So he's so passionate about clean beds. So look, I'm here to tell you the good beds. You, you make the calls, you find out about the beds, you test them out if you can. I don't know what you prefer, but what I, what I prefer is everyone stays away from these toxic mattresses. Start making an investment. Your health is an investment, right? The bed may seem expensive on the surface, but this is something you're laying on for eight hours a day, every single day, all the time, watching Netflix movies, you know, sometimes doing work, reading books, making love, all that fun stuff. And we're over here not even paying attention to the materials in the bed. What's off-gassing? Sometimes when things off-gas, a lot of the time, we can't even smell it. 
Off-gassing doesn't always have a smell, so pay very close attention because for the life of the mattress, it will be off-gassing. So this is a perfect investment to make right around the holidays. I'm here to give you all the information that I can. I really hope you love this part. Now, please can we get the special guest in. I cannot wait to talk to him. My close friend, Tyler Functional Foods. Please, I need a pen for an autograph. I'm ready to go. Hey, all right, everyone. I have a special guest today. And when I mean special, I mean special uh, for real. And here's why. He's one of my good friends. And he is a brightest star in naturopathic school. And finally, and I'm telling you finally, I've been trying to work this guy to come to LA forever. Finally, we got him here because he's so busy. Tyler. Tyler Functional Foods, the one, the only. Please let me get an autograph first and foremost before we even start. <laughs> how you doing, my friend? Dude, it's so good to be here. I'm yeah. doing great. I'm excited for this. Yeah. How how have I've been asking you for how long? Since th- since day one, right? Since day one, easily. Okay. It's yeah. been about 42 weeks. Even finally. when you were manifesting this, you were like, you know what? We're going to have a podcast. Yes. What should the title be? Yeah. And yeah. Now, it, now it's here. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and talking about manifestation, right? Yeah. Both of us are really creating some awesome stuff. Yeah. Dude, proud of you. Are you a believer in the power of creating like that? I am. I am. I and it's been that. awesome just to see what this whole community has done yeah, um, yeah. the last year. So why don't you tell, I mean, I, I don't know what listener or uh, viewer doesn't know your work, but why don't you tell those who don't what you do? Yeah. I'm currently a third year naturopathic medical school for those that don't know me, um, but really, you know, got down this journey of really trying to uncover more truth. And, you know, I really had my own health care or health issues growing up and just didn't feel aligned with the medical system. And so I pursued this path in naturopathic medicine that really looks at identifying the root cause and takes more of an integrative, holistic and preventative approach to medicine. And so um, I, with those health struggles, I really got into food and I found a lot of healing in food and really believe in the message that food is medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, so I came to Instagram, I came to social media. It was, it started as a, a recipe account and sharing how you can make food that is better for you, tastes good. Uh, mm-hmm. I think a lot of times too, we think about, you know, eating healthier that we had to compromise taste and it's not as pleasurable, but you got to make sure that you are checking off all those boxes. And mm-hmm. so that's what brought me here. And then I was like, you know what? I really love to teach. And mm-hmm. so it's kind of just grown into this platform about informed consent. I think that's what we're all here for. And mm-hmm. it's just giving people um, more information, more power and empowering them to really advocate for themselves. And mm-hmm. so that they can, in a way, be their own best doctor, as Dr. Yeah. Jess would say. Yeah, so, as Dr. Jess would say. And yeah. you do you do it so well because there's an art behind being able to explain sometimes complex content or material and putting it and simplifying it, that transition sometimes gets lost. And we see that a lot in let's say different teachers or different pages even. And we're like, uh, I don't know if anyone's getting it that way, but the way we're synthesizing this information, putting it together is very clear. And I love that. I mean, sometimes, I, sometimes I'll go and you know, you'll talk about essential fatty acids. I'm like, oh yeah, of course. You know, like <laughs> it's a refresher for me because you know, you make it clear enough that I don't even have to go back to look at, read, read, read the books or anything. Absolutely. Like and I love to get into the science and the weeds of things, mm-hmm. but I know for a lot of people too, it's not really digestible. So how can you take that complex information, make it digestible, but also actionable? I think there always needs to be like, what can I do about this too? So that people are leaving feeling empowered and it's like, I have control of this. And I think that's, that's the big message I think we're all trying to spread is that we have a lot more control and power on terms of our health than we have been led to believe. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think that's super important and it starts with the foundations. And it's funny, we were talking about this yesterday, that it's like medicine is moving back towards the foundations. It's the simple things. It's the diet. Make sure you're eating wholesome, nutrient-dense foods, that you're sleeping, that you have community, that you're moving your body and exercising, and you're reducing that amount of stress in your environment. And mm-hmm. so all those things, if you were to just focus on that, those aspects, like you're going to find immense relief. Um, if you can really prioritize those foundations. Yeah. So, and and what you just mentioned, so foundations, but I, I think it's important to, well, let's not graze over that because for people to understand, a lot of them come to, you know, when, after you'll come out of school and if you mm-hmm. start seeing patients, you'll see that a lot of them say, hey, what can I take for this? What can mm-hmm. I do for this? And then automatically you, people don't understand that there's work to put that foundation in place see where that is and then go. And then, and then you had also mentioned about where you are in your healing, if you're healing or optimizing. So how do we tie in all of that and so the viewers and listeners can better understand what, how they can start first and foremost? Yeah, that's a great, great question. And I love to always paint that picture for people too, because I get this question a lot. Is it, you know, 
do you ever cheat like in terms of like meals? Do you have cheat meals and stuff like that? And you know, my answer is like, I don't really view it as a cheat meal, first of all, but you know, I make these um, intentional conscious decisions in terms of what I'm gonna fuel my body with. But I think it's also important for the context of like, am I currently in a heal state where it's like, maybe I'm having current flares or I'm dealing with an autoimmune condition or you know any of these uh, chronic inflammatory conditions. And so I need to be more strict on terms of my diet, making sure I'm really getting that sleep in, reducing my stress, that I'm moving my body and I'm really taking care of myself as opposed to being in an optimization state where it's like, you know, I feel good, but I'm just, you know, I think I could feel even better. And mm -hmm. so like, I really want to see how I can and um, how far I can really push my body in that regard. And that's where I think there's more leniency to kind of incorporate some of that. So, you know, it's it's the foundations like you talked about, and it's starting there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for each person, they may respond better to certain areas of those pillars that we like to call them, the yeah. foundations. Diet, I definitely think, is 100% one of the most important foundational principles, but it is not the end-all, be-all, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. I wish it, I wish it was all food. And that was kind of the thing, too, that I realized through doing my Instagram, too, was that it's like food is important, but there's more to it mm -hmm. uh, than just the food. Mm -hmm. so. Like sleeping, right? Remember we talked about sleep for like 45 minutes straight yesterday? Sleep, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and the problem is, is what? We have disrupted sleep. We're not mm -hmm. listening to our sleep what what's what's optimal sleep like six hours five hours and it's different for every person yeah. so it's always like for who are you, you you know are you somebody that you know you're sleeping 10 hours but you feel depleted you don't mm. feel refreshed and you need to start investigating why start asking those questions mm -hmm. you know and that's thinking something that i i really like about this medicine is it it challenges us a little bit i always feel like i have to really put on my thinking cap and think critically about why is, why is this happening you know, even if someone were to get benefits, there's no research to suggest that this would be beneficial. Why would somebody notice benefits from this? You know, mm -hmm. really start being that detective. And so with sleep, you got to think about what are all these different factors that would influence a good night's sleep? And then what maybe are these um, comorbidities that these people are dealing with that could impact their quality of sleep? Mm -hmm. um, what are these different environmental factors that could be impacting that too? Um, and then of course you can get into the supplements and stuff like that, like you were talking about mm -hmm. earlier. But, you know, I think we also, to go back to answer your previous question too, it's like, I think the way that our current medical model is set up is we are led to believe that there's a pill for everything. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's just like, oh, like I just need to take this or that. And so I think a great example too is like curcumin. And we can talk about that a little bit later mm -hmm. with the whole inflammation mm -hmm. topic that we're going to get into. But, you know, curcumin still, if you're taking it as an anti-inflammatory, is masking or suppressing systemic inflammation. Mm -hmm. So it's not your curcumin deficient. And if you were to get off curcumin, does that inflammation come back? If it comes roaring back, well, there's still an underlying root cause that hasn't been addressed. And so you need to, you know, work with a functional medicine or or a holistically minded doctor, a naturopathic doctor mm -hmm. that is really going to come up to bat for you and advocate for you and really look for what are those root causes that are that is causing the systemic inflammation. Yeah. So, and for those who are a little bit unaware about maybe what functional naturopathic medicine is, what's the difference then? Because let's say I have arthritis mm -hmm. and curcumin's working wonderfully for me yeah. and my conventional doctor goes, oh, if it's working for you, it's working for you. What are we missing? What, what can a naturopathic or functional doctor do that can be different than what, let's say, conventional. Yeah, and you know, I think I see naturopathic doctors as an integral part of this integrative medical approach. And so it's having a team of physicians with you to tailor to the patient and your needs. So you have your MD, maybe you have your acupuncturist, you have your naturopathic doctor, you maybe have an energy healer on board, but you're taking the best of all those different forms of medicine to really tailor to you and what you need. I don't think it's like naturopathic doctors or functional medicine or the highway kind of thing. It's mm -hmm. like, we need all those forms of medicines depending on where we're at. And not every Everybody too wants necessarily to truly heal and or they're looking for the natural approach. For some people, they're like, hey, you know, I know I could change all these lifestyle things, but right now where I'm at, I just want the drug. You know, it, it's the, it can be um, that, that simple fix, but I think it's also important that, you know, while we're always looking at like, what's that root cause and how mm -hmm. can we get to that underlying root cause that we have to cater to the patient right then and there, maybe palliate some of those symptoms. But if we are putting them on a pharmaceutical, you've talked about this, Leo. What's the plan to get this person off mm. of this? Like, yes, let's use it, preserve the quality of life, and really, tr and you know, help that patient where they're at right now. Yeah. But what is our ultimate game plan long term in terms of how we can get this person off of this if they're open to um, working on some of these lifestyle things, which can be pretty invasive? Yeah, very, and and that's an important point to bring home is that if you're going to be 
prescribed a medication, mm -hmm. then then there needs to be a plan at one, what point you're going to get off of it because it should not be a lifelong plan. Because remember, we're not getting to the underlying root cause, yeah. right? If I if I'm an arthritic, if I have arthritic knee, I'm getting some pain relief. Mm -hmm. That should not be something I you know, crutch on all day every day. But it's a matter of really understanding. Well, what the heck am I eating, right? What's going on with my blood sugar? Why do I have yeah. systemic inflammation? Which actually brings us to our next topic. Yeah. Now, you before we even go into it, you wrote this really awesome ebook that has been on fire, right? And it's and well. th that's that's my little analogy because we're talking about inflammation. It's been on fire and it's done well because you actually have given people foods that are anti-inflammatory. And for me, what's really interesting is um, from a sports wise, Tom Brady eats an anti-inflammatory diet and this guy is like 50. No, I'm just kidding. He's, he's like, like 42. 42. Yeah, yeah, he's like 42. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I, I kid you not, this guy has been playing since I was like 13. I, I don't understand yeah. how he's still been around in, in a sport that's so rough and rugged. Absolutely. So so do you, do you think how big of a, for him, do you think that is the diet has to be a huge yeah. part of it? I mean, diet, I mean, yeah, Tom Brady, I think has really put the impact that food has on performance on the map for people and realizing that it's foundational when it comes to recovery. And so when you talk about food, making sure that you're fueling your body with those right nutrients and, you know, maybe it's these anti-inflammatory foods, but also removing foods that could be causing more inflammation too, that are going to perturb that recovery process, because that's the goal, right? Yeah. As an athlete, you want to be able to perform day in and day out yeah. and not have to take off an extra day because your body hasn't fully recovered. So food, along with sleep, moving your body, stretching, all those things that we were going to talk about, play a role in that ability to recover. So mm -hmm. food is foundational, as we were talking about earlier. So so when, when you say the word inflammation, some people might be like, well, I stubbed my toe, it's really red, uh, it's, it's sore. That's inflammation that people may understand. But you mean to tell me that there's like a, a low level inflammation over time? Like what happens? Yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, that's a great point that you make up, you, that you bring up. And so, you know, there's acute inflammation and then there's chronic inflammation. And so most of us are familiar with acute inflammation, which is, comes from an insult typically to tissue. Um, and so what happens is that there's redness, there's swelling, there's limited range of movement, there's pain. You know, we've all maybe hurt our elbow or our knee, mm -hmm. we fell down and we notice that inflammation and acute inflammation serves an important role uh, where it recruits a lot of these components of the immune system to help heal that tissue quicker. So for acute inflammation, there's supposed to be this rise um, in these different markers that the, is part of the immune system. And then it's supposed to resolve within a couple days to a week. Then we have chronic inflammation. So acute inflammation plays an important role, but with chronic inflammation, this is basically inflammation that's gone unchecked. And so there's this chronic low grade inflammation that's happening at all times. And it ends up really leading to tissue um, damage, it leads to uh, degeneration of the body and different tissues and joints. And when you talk about, you know, at the, the core of all disease pathology that we study about in like pathophysiology, we talk about chronic inflammation being at the root and it's the root cause mm -hmm. of a lot of these issues. So the thought is always, how can we dampen that inflammatory response? And a lot of times it's using stuff like corticosteroids and it's using stuff like Advil and NSAIDs. Um, which specifically targets a lot of these enzymes that are part of the inflammatory cascade to suppress that pain and inflammation. So yes, inflammation is good when it's you know appropriate in terms of acute care, um, but when it goes on long-term chronically, we really need to address that because yes, okay, we talked about inflammation being at the root of it, but why is there inflammation in the first place? Mm -hmm. So maybe we can talk a little bit more about what all those different factors are. Yeah, and actually but some people will be inflamed for years and years and 20 years, 30 years, and then, you know, along with every other thing that hits it right on the bullet right in the head, then they create cancer in their body, yeah. right? Or everything in between. Like we go back to arthritis, right? Maybe that's just chronic breakdown of that tissue. It is. And um, it's like turning up the heat, right? Yeah. Turning up the heat a little bit. So first of all, I know you are huge on food. So what are people eating right now that is majorly inflammatory to their diet and maybe they don't even know right now. Yeah. Yeah, what, 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 what are we talking right now so we can teach these So people? typically when you're talking about an anti-inflammatory diet, it's removing a lot of foods that can are problem allergenic and inflammatory foods. And so um, these are things like gluten, dairy, soy, corn, uh, shellfish, refined sugars and processed grain uh, based foods, um, alcohol being one of those two. Eggs are a common um, inflammatory food for, mm -hmm. for some. 
too. Uh, for some people, it can be very nutrient dense and people can do well with it, but for other people, it could be one of the worst foods for them. So it's, you know, it's really a individualized approach yeah. to nutrition, but those are the common ones that we learn about even in school. And it's like, let's start here. But also when you're doing this, this is kind of based on an elimination diet. It leaves people feeling hopeless at times too, where it's like, well, now what do I eat? Because you know, a lot of these foods, the flours, and um, you know, maybe it's eggs and the sugar and um, corn, corn everywhere. and yeah. dairy. Yeah. You know, those are a large food group and a large staple in people's diets. So then it's like, okay, now I got to move over to these whole nutrient dense foods. But I don't know how to cook. You know, yeah. Doctor G, I don't know how to cook. Mm -hmm. Like, so how can I? You know, one make you have to make this sustainable. So you have to have it taste good, but also starting to learn to get back in the kitchen, cook with these foods. And so some of these anti-inflammatory foods, most of them are coming from plants. And so you talk a lot about the benefits of a plant-based diet. You know, you're getting all these phytochemicals. So these phytochemicals are things like your polyphenols and your antioxidants, which are like these biologically active compounds that aren't essential, but they help optimize the function of the human body. And mm -hmm. when you're talking about cancer, I mean, urine cancer, mm -hmm. a lot of these um, compounds that have been studied, stuff like curcumin, ECGC found in green tea, quercetin, resveratrol that is found in peanuts and in grapes. Mm -hmm. um, you have stuff like uh, DIM and sulforaphane. All these stuff are anti-inflammatory compounds, but they also alter our genetic expression, epigenetics, mm -hmm. uh, in a way that turns down that inflammatory volume. Um, and it also changes our genes in a way that doesn't allow for this over proliferation of cells that could lead down the road mm -hmm. to cancer. Mm -hmm. Which again, food is medicine, right? It because is. there's instruction in there that tells our body what to do pretty flawlessly, isn't? which is incredible to yeah. think that we're connected to the stuff that's growing out of the soil. What do you mean we're connected, right? Mm -hmm. And I love that you find passion in that. Um, so staying away from like those allergenic foods or foods that really you react to, right? I can't eat eggs. Yeah. Before I stopped eating all animal products, eggs were killing me. Mm -hmm. I even tried one or two, it killed me. And the same thing with my brother. You know, uh, so maybe it's a, it's a weird genetic thing we got going. Yeah, and typically too, it's people are reacting to the proteins in those foods. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, a lot of people do egg whites because they're thinking protein mm -hmm. um, and they're reacting to the pro the egg white, mm -hmm. the albumin protein and not the yolk. And I think we've also kind of feared the yolk because of the cholesterol, the saturated mm -hmm. fat. I don't think it's all it's, you know, been talked up to be and I don't think we need to fear the yolk, but it also really depends on the individual. What is their cardiovascular risk factor? Mm -hmm. um, what is their insulin sensitivity like? Is there insulin resistance? Is this person diabetic? Uh, what is the total inflammatory load on this person? There's a lot of nuances to look at in terms of, you know, how this person what their um, lipid profiles looking like and metabolic function as well. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and you know, I love this quote by Michael Pollan, just to go back to something that you're mentioning er earlier. And he talks about how food is our way of engaging with the external world. And so what we're mm -hmm. putting in our body is our way of connecting to the world around us mm -hmm. um, because we're putting basically life around us, these plants into our bodies. And then our genes, I like to think of as these like nutrient sensors that are very dynamic and they're scanning our internal environment. Mm -hmm. And so all those different phytochemicals that are in those foods are giving information to our genes and turning our genes on or or off in a positive or negative way. I love that, yeah, and it's so true. So then imagine what these synthetic, man-made, laboratory-made foods are doing to our genetics, Yeah. right? The, those sensors gotta be going off left and right and up and down. Inflammation. Right? Yeah, so inflammation. And, and so inflammation, and that's the other thing too, is it also comes back to the soil. Mm -hmm. And so all those micro um, microbial components too that comes from the soil, and if the soil isn't rich in all these nutrients, well, it's not in the food too. So not only people that eat a rather standard American diet that's, you know, rich in a lot of these hyper palatable processed foods, you know, you have bleached flour and stuff like that, but these are synthetic micronutrients too. So you're not getting all those micronutrients. Uh, there's no fiber. And mm -hmm. so it leads to like what I like to call a blood sugar avalanche where it's going to really spike up your blood sugar. Mm -hmm. It's going to bump up insulin. You're going to feel like you have a lot of energy for an hour, hour and a half, and then you're going to feel hungry again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes this vicious cycle too. So fiber is this important regulatory component that helps stabilize blood sugar so it doesn't spike as much and you feel full for longer and that way you can go three or four hours in between meals not feeling hungry and you feel satiated throughout that time. Yeah and one thing our mutual friend uh, Dr. Mary Party was saying is that we have to pay close attention to eating and then stop not eating, not mm -hmm. snacking, not grazing so we activate that complex in our body so we can digest properly because yeah. it's really activated about like three hours or four hours later. That migrating but, motor complex. Exactly. Yeah. The migrating, so we eat and then you know two hours later we're snacking on another thing. She's like, if anything, water and, and just if you have gut issues. So I just yeah. wanted to bring that up because I think that's yeah. really important for us to 
you know, these eating habits. Absolutely. So, but back to inflammation. Is, is food the only cause of inflammation? What else? I, I know I know you put up a really yeah. good post the other day. Yeah. And you had more than one cause. I think it was 20. Yeah. Uh, so we, we let, let, let's teach us, basically. Where we want to know. Where's this inflammation coming from? Yeah, I mean, food is definitely one of the first places to start. So in, in a general rule of thumb, I think, because it can get dogmatic in a way, and it's it's can be a little frustrating, I think, for the, for the audience at large to figure out what the hell do I eat now? Um, you know, there's lectins, there's oxalates, there's huh. carnivore, there's mm. keto, there's paleo, there's vegan, there's vegetarian. Um, there's always something out there that people want to demonize. And I think for most people that are looking at where to get started, just focusing on whole, unadulterated, real foods. Mm -hmm. Think about nutrient density and thinking about whole foods. You can't go wrong with that. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a step up from eating some of these um, foods that are man-made and they're nutrient devoid and lack that fiber. Um, and it's really going to do a number on our blood sugar. And so when it comes to inflammation, food is going to influence that blood sugar. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, there's research to show that, you know, the, that insulin insulin resistance in particular, um, and those with diabetes, you know, there's an integral role with inflammation with that in terms of um, higher circling levels of nuclear factor kappa beta. So mm -hmm. I'll just do a little intro in terms of like what is inflammation mm -hmm. uh, before we get into each of these things. So maybe it'll make more sense in terms of yeah. how these things are impacting inflammation in, in those markers. So typically when there's an inflammatory insult, you have um, this insult, you have what is called reactive oxygen species. So there's this oxidative stress on the body where you have these free radicals that can damage tissue. And what the body does is it, you know, the inflammatory response is part of the immune system's way of adapting to this external st stimuli. And so what happens is you get an upregulation of this transcription factor that goes to the nucleus and it turns on called nuclear factor kappa beta. And it turns on all these pro-inflammatory cytokines. So these are basically chemical messengers that come to join the party and they're like, let's bump this inflammation up. And so this is stuff like IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha, and a lot of your biologics or anybody that is dealing or you know taking anti-inflammatory medications, they're typically acting on a number of different pathways. Either it's to shut down nuclear factor kappa beta, to uh, shut down TNF-alpha, or it's working on this icosanoic pathway. So for those that have more of that biochemistry mind, it's the icosanoic pathway that, you know, a lot of your corticosteroids are working on Advil and, and along a lot of your nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, along with curcumin and boswell and these natural anti-inflammatories. Mm. So it's really important to understand where these are working. And when we're talking about how does this cause inflammation, it's typically you have higher circulating values of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, but also higher amounts of nuclear factor kappa beta. Mm -hmm. So if nuclear factor kappa beta, or I'll just say NF kappa B, um, is in higher amounts, there's higher amounts of inflammation going on. So mm -hmm. the goal would then be to get lower amounts of that transcription factor circulating so that there's less inflammation in the body. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to someone with diabetes or they have high, high amounts of insulin or they're hyperglycemic, so high blood sugar, which food impacts that, sleep, lack of sleep impacts that, stress impacts that. Um, you know, we're causing more uh, free radical production and damage within those arterial walls, um, and that can lead to um, this damage. And so with the endothelial walls, there's typically an alter, there's a change in the structure of those walls. Typically they're smooth mm -hmm. and things can flow easily right through it. But when they get damaged, they get almost like Velcro and they attract a lot of these things. Think about plaques. When people mm -hmm. talk about atherosclerosis, there's an inflammatory insult there that changes the endothelial function in a way, and it causes cholesterol to build up these plaques, um, LDL cholesterol, which is uh, oxidized and it's really inflammatory and they build up these foam cells. And so I think it's important to realize that blood sugar has a huge connection with that and food influences that, but sleep and stress does as well. So yeah. thinking about what, okay, so if high blood sugar, high insulin is a driving inflammatory insult because it increases nuclear factor kappa beta, how can I de decrease mm -hmm. that? And so that comes back to eating whole foods, reminding a lot of the, re removing a lot of those refined processed foods, I'm really focusing on fiber in those foods too. And, you know, I really believe more of a plant centric approach um, and really how much, you know, polyphenols can you get in eating the rainbow stuff like that too, mm -hmm. because they all have these benefits that are anti-inflammatory, um, anti-cancer, as well as bolstering these endogenous um, defense systems that we have inside the body. So mm -hmm. it's really working with the body and not against the body. Yeah. And giving those signals to downregulate all of those factors yeah. that you're talking about, yeah. which is incredible because nature gave us natural Tylenol, right? Natural exactly. Advil, yeah. which is beautiful. One thing that, um, to, to illustrate the beauty of the body, you mentioned the change in the, in the inside of the blood vessels, the mm -hmm. endothelial wall. You know, there's plaque being 
deposited there. Mm -hmm. But the way I paint the picture is I'm saying that that is nature's way of protecting itself, much like we create a callus on our hand when we're working out. It's literally a callus in our blood vessels. But we demonize that cholesterol plaque. We do without understanding what the root cause is. Yeah. Could be, like you said, high blood sugar, diabetes, diabetic state, high blood pressure, stress. Mm-hmm. So this is why we go back to those fundamentals, right? Because those fundamentals, once you got those down and they're locked in, man, you're already in a good place. Your body's in a good place. And then you supplement with all that other good stuff. There you go, yeah. Um, so you, you have this awesome list. Yep. What, what else? What, what else? Yeah. yeah, what else? Let's go. So ahead. yeah, you have the... And so I, I, I think it's important too to realize, I talked about oxidative stress earlier and reactive oxygen species, and that's kind of like the catalyst that initiates this inflammatory process. And I'll say that oxidative stress is a normal part of cellular metabolism, and that we're always producing these free radicals. So it's not necessarily... Um, that it's a bad thing, but it's how are we able to squelch those free radicals? And so it goes this, it's kind of like a balance, like a teeter-totter. You have these pro-oxidants in your environment, but you also have antioxidants. So we were talking about phytochemicals. And so phytochemicals are things like polyphenols and antioxidants that are found in fruits and vegetables. So dietary antioxidants, Um, but you also have these built-in endogenous uh, antioxidant defense system. So this is stuff like glutathione that a lot of people have heard about, your master antioxidant in the body. And it's involved with um, liver detoxification as well. You have catalase and you have superoxide dismutase. And then on the other end, you have prooxidants. So these are things like when you smoke cigarettes, when you drink alcohol, when you're exposed mm-hmm. to radiation, when you're eating a highly refined um, inflammatory diet. Um, these things are going to cause more prooxidation. So it's not like, you know, it's it's a balance of like how much prooxidation do you have versus how much anti and you know antioxidants do you have and you want to balance those out and so that's the whole idea too with ozone because i know it's a, a growing field that it's you know getting really popular it's it's introducing a pro oxidant into the environment with the idea that it's going to upregulate or boost mm-hmm. your body's internal mechanisms mm-hmm. to increase antioxidants which is going to lead to resolution of inflammation and cause tissue repair in that area that needs mm-hmm. needs repair needs mm-hmm. help so yeah stress is obviously a big one too and how that can change this whole sympath- and lead us into the sympathetic drive i think so many of it too environmental toxins which i know you talk about mm-hmm. too um and i love this quote by um it's Francis Collin, I believe, that said it. And he said, the, in, the genetics loads the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. So yeah. you have to think about what are all these heavy metals that we're exposed to? What about all, all these organopesticides and these solvents and um, stuff like perchlorate and bisphenols? Mm-hmm. And um, a lot of these compounds that we're exposed to, and I love to give this analogy too, it's like one thing is the exposure, but also how are you removing it too? And so if you think of your liver as like a, a bathtub, what is the exposure, what's coming in, but then at the same time too, is that is that drain open? Mm-hmm. So what's coming in, is it coming out at the same time? Because if that drain is clogged, well, you're gonna get a buildup and more of this toxemia effect, and it's always not a matter of like that one exposure, it's the total toxic burner, that total toxic load, which can lead to more oxidative stress, Mm -hmm. inflammation in the body. And again, it's kind of that buildup of toxemia Mm -hmm. that we talk about. And so how are you supporting your endogenous detoxification systems and antioxidant defense systems? And I think food plays a role in that too. And people have gotten really interested in uh, NRF2. I don't know Mm -hmm. if you've talked Mm -hmm. about that much with your audience. So NRF2 uh, is a transcription factor that that binds in the nucleus to antioxidant response elements, AREs. Mm -hmm. And there are certain foods that modulate this. And so when those, that stuff like, again, curcumin, DEM, so diendyl methane that is found in cruciferous vegetables, mm-hmm. sulforaphane also found in cruciferous vegetables, resveratrol, which we talked about earlier, quercetin, all these things. So they help modulate genetic expression and turning on these internal antioxidant def- defense systems, which are a good thing. So that's going to, one, squelch inflammation. It's going to upregulate glutathione production, which is a good thing, too. Mm-hmm. It's also going to upregulate our phase two liver detox enzymes, too. So that it's kind of like, it's you know, it's it's an intelligence of the body where yeah. it's really working with that. It's like, okay, let's resolve this. Let's get rid of it. Let's mm-hmm. turn on all these defense systems so that the body is really, you know, put in this seat to heal. And that's the thing is like, and what I love about naturopathic medicine is it's putting the body in a position to heal by giving it what it needs and then removing any of those obstacles that mm-hmm. are perturbing normal physiological function and biochemical function. Yeah. And and the beautiful thing is once you do those steps, you just yeah. let the body do what it does. Exactly. And that could be any disease. It could be a strep throat. It could be a breast cancer. Yeah. The complexity is different, but really working with the body. And I think we need to highlight that's what we do in naturopathic medicine. Yeah. One of our tenets is really to work with the body Absolutely. instead of instead of thinking that you're coming to heal the body yourself. Yeah. Because you, I'm telling you, 
you ain't no rescuer here. It's the body that's doing the rescuing. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. The so yeah, the, you got the food. Yeah, we got the food. Um, we got the food. I think we've talked about that. We have obviously this oxidative stress component and how the body tries to modulate that. And I mean, just some of those things, what are going to do, you know, cause more oxidative stress? And it's those environmental toxins. It's, you know, smoking, it's radiation exposure, it's alcohol. Yeah. Um, and it's all these different factors. Sleep is a big one. And we just talked about that too. There was a 2008 study that uh, was looking at sleep deprivation in otherwise healthy individuals. One night's sleep where you restricted an eight hour night sleep by 25 to 50% cause increased levels of nuclear factor kappa beta. And so not only was there more inflammation the next day in that individual, but those people were less able to uh, tolerate um, glucose in a way in terms of the foods that they were eating. So they were more insulin resistant the next mm -hmm. day. So, you know, it's really interesting how our body adapts in this way. And, you know, we don't really think about these things. And I know for a lot of us too, I mean, you know, we're really, you know, busy people who are trying to, you know, mm -hmm. put a lot out there and we're go, 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 you know, making sure that we're stepping back and making time to prioritize sleep because it's so foundational to set up the rest yeah. of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and it can also be one of those root causes of inflammation. And I think some people... I know have experience where it's like, I only got two or three hours of sleep last night and they wake up, they're like, I feel really puffy. I feel inflamed. Mm -hmm. And it can be literally because of that lack of sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Which makes so much sense. And I think sleep is becoming sexier. I'm it telling is. you, it, is. it wasn't like two years ago, Yeah. Uh, but the importance of it, and especially like you and I have aura rings, like we get to actually look at our sleep patterns. Uh. I didn't know that. I mean, my pillars were good except sleep. Mm -hmm. And and I still sometimes struggle with sleep. I just stay up late sometimes. But um, we all have our. But regardless, that is so important. It's integral. Yeah. Um. So what else are we talking aside from sleep then? Yeah. So the sleep, and then obviously reduce your alcohol and you know consumption too. Yeah. So that's also going to increase. It's a prooxidant in the body, so it's going to increase inflammation too. So you know when you're going out, consider mocktails sometimes. I know because it's there's also that social component to going out and and drinking and and that commute. You know there can be community Again, around that too. Yeah, and we were talking yeah. about that. So. How can I still enjoy and, and partake in these things, but not necessarily, you know, drinking a lot of alcohol if that's part of my my job environment too? Mm -hmm. um, also, gut dysbiosis. I think it all starts back in the gut too, mm -hmm. and so even with alcohol, it's going to actually impact that permeability and the integrity of that the gut junction in terms of. Um, typically, you know, your GI tract is this hollow tube that should just go mouth to anus and it selectively absorbs these certain compounds when mm -hmm. we're bringing in food. But you also have that immune system that underlies the, the digestive tract and that you hear that statistic being thrown around by a lot of people that 60 to 80% of your immune system is in your gut. And what they're talking about is this um, lymphoid tissue, so the gut associated lymphoid tissue, which is the prior patches, which are really concentrated immune cells. And it makes sense that they're placed there because when we're eating food from our environment, we're exposed to all of these microorganisms. And so we want our immune system ready and primed mm -hmm. for that inflammatory insult or that invader coming in. But also there should, you know, it needs to be selective in terms of the nutrients that we're absorbing. And we shouldn't have this leakiness or permeability of uh, undigested proteins and environmental toxins that are seeping through, which can lead to systemic inflammation. Mm -hmm. And so when you're talking about chronic inflammation and even autoimmune disease, where there is a lot of chronic complex pathology, but, cr you know, complex inflammation, chronic inflammation, a lot of that is is coming back to the gut and this breaching gut integrity too and how your gut microbiome and the and the commensal flora in your gut also dictates and influences that gut integrity too. So one is like, how can we shut off that inflammatory response, this SOS response that something's going on here that we really need to address? Um, but also what are those things that influence a healthy gut microbiome? And again, it all comes back to food. Mm -hmm. So your prebiotics, your probiotics, cutting down on alcohol. Um, you know, we were just at this conference at A4M and they were talking about, you know, more than four weeks on a ketogenic diet, a high fat diet, how it made significant alterations in the gut microbiome in a negative way. And so really thinking about some of these things and using them as tools, thinking about it as tools and, and maybe it's a, a medicinal intervention, but you know, how can we really incorporate a lot more of these foods and gear towards tolerance. Maybe mm -hmm. if I do have an issue with a certain food, I have an allergy or something like that, asking why is that and always working towards, you know, how can I gain tolerance back to this food? Mm -hmm. And there's an immune gut microbiome connection to all this, which I'm not going to go into because it's very complex, mm -hmm. but it starts with reducing that inflammatory load in the body. It comes back to doing the basics with the sleep with the diet, with the community, with the stress reduction, with the moving your body. Um, obviously, I think drugs and pharmaceutical drugs, you know, they're absolutely necessary at times, but they do make 
impacts on our gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. They do deplete certain micronutrients. And so, you know, even if we are on these drugs, how can we support that terrain? You know, our internal terrain yeah. is really going to influence how we respond to a lot of these external environmental factors. Yeah, yeah. And a big part is, uh, is the chlorine in the water, right? That's, yeah. uh, that, that can actually have an antimicrobial effect. It, and that's why it's there, but um, it can also be affecting our gut. You yeah. know, you mentioned all these foods. How big is variety then with those foods? Variety is key. The more diversity of foods that we have in our diet, especially a lot of those prebiotic foods. So prebiotic being foods that um, are, are fibrous foods that feed the bacteria that, that are in our gut as opposed to probiotics, which are live um, bacterial organisms that actually populate the gut. And, you know, probiotics, a lot of people turn to. And I think those can also be a, a people are looking for that as like a quick fix kind of thing mm -hmm. like that. And mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong, they can absolutely be necessary, but you also have to know what is the strain and what has it been studied for because it's not like this just like blanket approach, like just throw a lactobacillus bacteria in the gut. You gotta also have it targeted to like, does this person have SIBO? Do they have right. IBD? Do they have you know more of this leaky gut picture? Mm -hmm. um, and there's certain strains that have been studied to benefit those, you know, those certain conditions. So, so variety's big. Yep, variety is Huge. big make sure that you're eating your fiber, prebiotics, and probiotics. And again, all those polyphenols, which are going to positively impact the gut microbiome as well. Okay. How, is there any other way that we need to reduce inflammation that's in your head? What are we missing? Anything else? I mean, there is a component of obese, uh, you know, obesity. And, you know, I am very well aware of kind of like the, the stigma about larger bodies in our profession. And when it comes to clinical obesity too, you know, there's the stigma that just because someone is overweight that they're not necessarily healthy. And I know that is not true. You know, you could, you could be carrying um, excess weight and still have, you know, good metabolic health. But, you know, I think it's always how can we get this person to an ideal weight where there is less weight that that person is carrying because we know that the more weight you carry, um, that adipose tissue, those fat cells, they're not just inert. They actually produce specific cytokines that are inflammatory mm -hmm. um, and other, um, they're endocrine factories mm -hmm. too. So they actually produce certain hormones which can interfere with our satiety signals and hunger signals in terms yeah. of hormones and that brain connection with all of that. Um, but also when we talk about toxins and our toxic exposure, we store a lot of those fat soluble toxins in that adipose tissue as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So that's why when people, you know, maybe they have more weight and they go through a detox phase and they are, what what is happening is they're mobilizing these toxins that have been stored in that adipose tissue and they can experience something called a Herxheimer reaction, mm -hmm. which is kind of like a toxic flu where you kind of feel those ill effects of mobilizing all those toxins from the adipose tissue into the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And so that's where it's important to, you know, really consider the individual and, you know, work with a doctor uh, because this isn't something to be taken lightly because some people may be harboring uh, a lot of, of those years toxins and over years, years yeah, yeah. 40, 50 years. Yeah. Um, and if you just were to mobilize all that in the bloodstream at once, you know, that could really set someone back. And oh, so yeah. Yeah. You can not, die. The body's smart. Yeah. It, it's, and it's putting it away. You have to protect the body in mm -hmm. a way. So, you know, gut microbiome, you know, getting into a healthy body weight, addressing food, thinking about all those different factors that could be causing inflammation from the environmental factors we were talking about. Everyone talks about mitochondrial dysfunction and oxidative stress and stuff like that. And it's like, well, what's causing that in the first place? That's always my next thought. It's like, yes, give all these antioxidants and all these cofactors that are essential for mitochondrial support, but why would the why would the mitochondria be dysfunctioning in the first place? Why, where's all this oxidative stress coming from? Mm -hmm. That could be from heavy metal accumulation. For it sure. could be from diet. It could be from not sleeping. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be from chronic stress where we're always kind of running away from this bear and we're always in this low grade fight or flight mode. And so yeah. again, it's and that's the hard thing is it's you know you're trying to empower people, but it's like it can be so many things. Yeah, yeah. So we what we do is just give this really good individualized advice as best as possible. Yeah. But it will not fit for everyone, right? No. Somebody can have an uh, issue with adipose toxicity. The other person could just not be sleeping. The other person could be stressed and it could be everything in between. Yeah. So really the thing we put out there for people is like, here's your information. Here's everything we can give you. Go see a doctor, go mm -hmm. see a professional, um, naturopathic or functional who can really work you up head to toe, inside out, ask you all the proper questions so you can get more individualized advice. Because really the, the real power is when you get that individual understanding of mm -hmm. yourself, yeah. whether it be through blood work or the, or the intake in itself. Mm -hmm. But that power, then you, and then you just skyrocket because you, know, you have a blueprint of what you need to do for yourself. It's crazy. Absolutely. Yeah. And working with a doctor that really will advocate for you. And yeah. I think that's also important too. And so if you feel frustrated with 
your current medical care, it's like you can always look for a second opinion. I think mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that too. And it doesn't have to be one way or, or the other. Like you can create an integrative team for you. For sure. Um, and so I think that is important is using all those best forms of medicine that we have available to us um, and realizing that there's always more to the story. There's always more answers. You just got to keep looking and keep asking why. Yeah. And I think oftentimes we stop asking those questions and we just, you know, all right, this is this is this is standard of care. This is how we're going to treat it. We're not going to look any further. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm I'm looking to to change that narrative, change that conversation. And we us, you know, yes, I think it's important that we are you know meeting the patient where they're at and we're palliating those symptoms. But you know, ultimately, I want it to be where. Um, patients really have that information and then it's like if they really want to truly heal they have all those tools necessary that they need to overcome all those obstacles and really put their body in a position to do some radical yeah. healing yeah you're already doing it though you're already doing out there you're putting it out there so mm -hmm. what are you gonna do now you graduate when I graduate in June of 2021. June of 2021, you're graduating, and then you have this ebook out. Are you going to put any more books out? Because people are waiting already. You know that, right? Yeah, another okay. book's coming out next year. Okay, um, no, another book next year. Yeah, so I started with the the recipe cookbook, yeah. um, which is all kind of based on an anti-inflammatory elimination diet. So mm -hmm. typically, you know, again, can be pretty restrictive. So here are nutrient dense, tasty recipes that I've made. Um, and you know, I did learn how to cook. I was a horrible cook, but, mm -hmm. um, through this journey of food, you know, I've had to really get acquainted with the kitchen and learn some of these culinary skills that I think really hold us back. So I try to make, you know, actionable, easy to make recipes yeah. that not only taste good, but it's giving you all that nourishment that you need to, uh, and it's removing some of those foods that may be impeding your healing process. Yeah, really um, important. But the next thing too is, is I think the education aspect. So I love to do these infographic pictures that are kind of like, um, you know, these foods, you know, for different macro. Oh, they're viral micro, every time. They're yeah, viral they're every time. Yeah. So doing something like that and really I, I see it as a food user's manual where it's kind of like all informed consent where it's like, we're going to talk about functional foods. We're going to talk about all the hot controversial foods too. Like, yeah. you know, does meat cause cancer? What's the deal with eggs? What's the deal with soy? What's yeah. the deal with sugar and gluten? And like, let's yeah. take a deep dive on this, but also let's talk about micronutrients and macronutrients and all these functional food groups how to build a, a balanced plate, food synergy, all these topics that a lot of people want more information on. Yeah. And I really see it as a, a digestible book that people can reference when they want these questions so that they can then be more informed shoppers when they're navigating the aisles at the grocery store. That's great. That's yeah. great. And then and then your Instagram page is what? Functional.foods. That's where you're going to find me. I hang out there most. You hang out there all the time. Yeah. And, and Probably it, too much. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it is like a, it's like literally a guide for people. You know, if we want to know where we get calcium or iron and what plant-based foods, perfect. Yeah. It's like, it's amazing for everyone. So, um, Tyler, I thank you for coming on the show, man. And uh, you're going to be back here 100%. Come back in the okay. summer. Okay. That sounds good. Or like the spring. Let's do spring. We any any chance I have to come back to LA, I'm, I'm always in. Okay. All right. Yeah. Perfect. And um, they'll follow you. And yeah, anything else you want to say before we go? No, I, th I think the important thing is like get back to the basics. And okay. I think if we were to summarize this whole thing too, it's like it's coming back to the basics. So prioritizing the sleep, make sure you're eating a whole nutrient dense diet, focus on prebiotics, probiotics, all those polyphenols and antioxidants from plant-based foods and always quality over quantity um, and trying to decrease that consumption of otherwise very processed and highly refined foods. Um, it's community. We're talking more and more about that too. I mean, there was a statistic that was that was going to say, but you know, I'll say it now, social, iso social isolation actually increases these pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-1, IL-6, mm -hmm. and TNF-alpha. Um, and so there's an important aspect to community. And when you think about the blue zones, community was very central to all of that mm -hmm. too. And these are places in the world where people, you know, talk about they have the longest lived lives and, you know, is it the diet? Is it the community? Is it that they're always moving and they were working outside and doing all this manual labor? There's so many different components, but community is central to all of that. Yeah, a thousand percent. So there you go, wrapped up in a bowl. Thank you, Tyler Functional Foods. We are blessed for your presence, my man. And um, we'll be talking later, okay? Sounds good. Thanks for having me, brother. All right. I told you Tyler would be amazing. I couldn't wait for this day and it finally came. I'm so happy. I really hope you help you with all the information you ever wanted to hear about nutrition and inflammation. Did you know that inflammation goes that far? Did you know that we were powerful enough to make those moves? So thank you for rating, reviewing, subscribing, supporting your favorite show. It's my personal favorite show. And uh, I have so much love for you all. Thank you for supporting. We are growing. We are coming with it. And I will see you next week.